Today I want to talk about the sun, um, but before I talk in detail about the sun, I want to go back and review what we were talking about before regarding light in the electromagnetic spectrum. So recall the electromagnetic spectrum is um, runs all the way from the radio to the gamma ray. The radio waves have very, very long wavelengths, like millimeter, millimeter to even meters and kilometers in size all the way down to gamma rays that have wavelengths of something like 10 to the minus 12 meters. So tiny, tiny little things. Um, light of uh, different wavelengths has different kind of photons associated with it. So the particles that make up light um, are much higher energy in gamma rays than they are in radio waves. Um, and visible light is somewhere in the middle. Uh, so that's kind of a summary of what we have. If you recall, there's other things that are kind of, you know, to keep in mind about light. Because light travels at the same speed in any given medium, regardless of what, well, almost regardless of what its wavelength is, uh, especially in air and in space, I mean, in, uh, in vacuums, um, every single wavelength has associated with it a single frequency. And... Um, so it's sort of equivalent to give the frequency of electromagnetic radiation as opposed to its wavelength. And it's common, for example, with radio to give the frequency of radio uh, waves as opposed to its wavelength. So you'll hear like, you know, 120 megahertz frequency, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why you'll talk about, that's why when you tune your radio dial to a given station, it's sort of it's shorthand for the megahertz for the frequency of the radio wave. Whereas you don't typically talk about the frequency of gamma rays. Um, you typically just talk about the energy of the gamma ray or the wavelength itself. But that is mostly convention and has nothing to do with what's underlying it. In reality, they all have frequencies. They all have wavelengths. Um, the final thing that, just to remind you, um, if you're looking at light of a given, uh, like if you're looking at an object that's, that's hot, and it's emitting light because it's hot. It's emitting a spectrum of radiation called black body radiation. And depending on the temperature of the thing, it will emit most of its light at a specific frequency. So the hotter the thing is, the shorter the wavelength of the light it will typically emit. So that's what this is supposed to be running along the bottom of this chart. If you have 10 million degree gas, it will tend to emit most of its light in the X-ray. Whereas if you have 1,000 degree or a few thousand degree gas, it will emit its light sort of in the visible, visible spectrum. Okay, so the sun is about 6,000 degrees. It emits the peak of its radiation around yellow. Um, and then finally, as you get stuff that's colder and colder, it emits its light in longer and longer wavelengths as it, as it glows. So things that are sort of 100 degrees, like us, uh, we emit our light in the infrared. And that's why we sense infrared radiation as heat. So we feel something is hot. What we're really sensing is the infrared radiation coming off of that thing. This is kind of a shorthand version of this chart that doesn't have any numbers. And I like it because it's very simple. So if you just want to put stuff in order, you know, there's radio waves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. And then the visible bit is broken up this way. You notice that the longest wavelength stuff is red, that goes with infrared, and the shortest wavelength stuff is violet, that goes with the ultraviolet on the far end. So ultraviolet is more violet than violet, and infrared is more red than red. Yeah? It's just called submillimeter. Um, submillimeter is just a sort of subclass of radio waves, and in certain fields, people call it submillimeter radio waves, but you don't have to worry about that. If you know what radio waves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray are, I'll be very happy. You don't have to worry about submillimeter. Just to sort of remind you that radio, this general area here, this is like all the transmission of uh, cell phone, you know, communication, Bluetooth, you know, with your computer. Most internet, wireless internet, is jammed in these frequencies, and you know. It's all divided up discreetly, and there's sort of a regulatory committee to decide, like, what band, you know, what specific broadcasts, you know, type, what type of instruments get to use certain broadcast range in the radio 
in the radio <laughs> range. And the reason why everyone uses radio for that type of communication is radio waves go through stuff. Okay, they're big, long wavelength things that tend to go through stuff. It wouldn't really make a lot of sense to just broadcast your signals in light, in visible light, because as soon as you went outside a room, you couldn't detect it anymore because it gets reflected off the walls. Radio is not like that, so that's why you use these longer wavelengths. And of course, TV is in here somewhere too. Um, okay, but of course, astronomers aren't concerned with TV and stuff like that. They were concerned with learning about the universe from uh, stuff that's far away. And it turns out by studying light from space and all of these di different wavelengths, we can learn about different things about uh, the universe around us. One of the really important techniques that we use to learn about the universe around us, uh, it's called spectroscopy. And spectroscopy basically is the study of specific emission and absorption lines that come off of objects when they're hot or when light goes through, say, a cold cloud of gas that absorbs some of the light. This, this phenomenon, um, the, the existence of spectral lines in the emission patterns of objects, comes down to um, something fundamental about atoms. Okay? When atoms absorb light or emit light, they tend to absorb or emit light in very discrete well, not very discrete, at discrete wavelengths, okay? And the discrete wavelengths that they tend to sort of like are the ones that correspond to the energy differences between the <laughs> orbitals of their electrons, okay? So if you imagine a very simple atom here, it has a ground state, that is, when it has an electron, the atom at its lowest energy configuration, the electron's going around in some, what's called the ground state imagine it sort of orbiting around. It's not really what it's doing, but it's something like that. Um, there's another place where that electron can be going around the atom, and that's what's called the second orbital, okay, or the second excited state. So the electron in principle could also go around the proton in some other discrete state, but nowhere in between. And the fact that there's this discrete difference between the inner one and the outer one is a sort of mysterious phenomenon of nature that's characterized in the physical sciences by quantum mechanics. Okay, this is a big mystery. Well, it was a big mystery in the early 20th century about why atoms did this, but it just turns out that they do. Um, and it turns out that that existence, the fact that there are all these structural states to atoms, um, is what allows us to understand the periodic table, um, all the 1s, 2p states, if you've taken, you know, if you've taken that stuff before. It all comes down to quantum mechanics. Um, but the bottom line is, because there's a discrete difference between the energy of the inner level and the next level and the next level and the next level, there's only very specific energies that um, atoms can absorb. So imagine you have a, an electron that's sitting in the ground state. You shine light on it. The only type of light that electron can absorb is light that will allow it to jump up to the next excited state or a next one or a next one. Nowhere in between. There's only very specific types of light that it can absorb. Okay. Um, unless, if, well, there are other type. well, the other thing that could possibly happen is if the photon is super duper energetic, it can knock the electron off the atom completely, and that's called ionize. So you can't ionize an atom with a really, really energetic photon of any energy. But in the middle there, there's only discrete types of light that it can absorb. Okay. This is a fundamental property of atoms. Does anyone have a question about that? Just that general concept? The bottom line is every single atom, depending on what's going on in the nucleus, has a discrete energy structure that it can sustain. And so if you change what's going on in the nucleus, you change that energy structure a little bit. And therefore, you change the type of light it can absorb or emit. <laughs> and what do I mean by changing what's going on in the nucleus? Well, the simplest thing you can change in the nucleus is the number of protons, okay? Remember, atoms have protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and they have electrons outside of it. Does anyone know what the number of protons tells you about the atom? <coughs> Sorry? The weight? Yeah, it tells you something about the weight. Of course, the neutrons there also help you tell about the weight. Like, does anyone know, for example, how many protons hydrogen has? One. How many protons does helium have? Two. 
the number of protons in the nucleus tells you the at what kind of atom it is. Okay? So that's the fundamental thing that tells us what type of atom we're dealing with. So if I change the, the number of protons in the nucleus, then I change exactly what can happen with the electrons going around it. I mean, a simple thing, simple way to understand that at first is just, you have two protons in the nucleus, the positive charge sitting in the nucleus is now two. And therefore, the electron feels a stronger positive charge than it did before. And so it's going to go around in a different way. So it has a different energy structure. And so the way electrons behave depends sensitively on what's going on in the nucleus. And that's one reason why, you know, as you move along the periodic table, you get different types of interactions. Because the electrons are behaving in different ways. The different types of atoms interact with each other in different ways. But the fundamental thing that we care about, if we want to try to learn about stuff by examining its light, is the fact that there are these discrete signatures for every type of atom. So the idea is, if I have a white light, let's say I have a light that's emitting off like white light, or a spectrum of light like a black body, it has a rainbow, and it emits in all directions. Then I have a blob of cold gas that's made of some kind of atom. As the light shines through that gas, the photons that are coming through that are just the right energy get absorbed by the atom, and the atom goes to an excited state. And then when we look at that light from the other side of the gas blob, we see like discrete lines in its spectrum. These are, this is the wavelength of light that was absorbed. If we can measure exactly what those wavelengths are, then we can figure out what kind of gas this blob is made of. Okay. So on the sun, for example, there's gas like at the edge of the sun that's sort of part of what's actually you know, glowing. So with the sun, we can learn about the chemical makeup of the sun by using the inner, you know, sort of the inner, well, the, the shell of the sun is emitting light, and then there's atoms in the sun as well that are absorbing <coughs> at the same time, and we use this to figure out what the sun is made of and other stars and things like that. So that's basically how it works. Now imagine, now that's not the only thing that can happen. So imagine also you've got this vast, this heat source basically that's shining this way. All right? And if you're lucky enough to have a telescope sitting here, you can figure out what it's made of by looking at the absorption line. But let's say instead, you know, you're in the, you know, it's just happenstance where the Earth happens to be relative to this gas cloud. Let's say it's here. And we wanna, we're just looking that way. So what you would see then is the light that's... There's some of these atoms get excited. So the, 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 the electron jumps out. And eventually, it wants to fall back down to where it came from. Okay? And when it does, it emits a photon of the same energy that got it there. And when it so and that photon has a very specific wavelength, the same wavelength that was absorbed. And so in this case, what you would see is an emission spectrum. You would see just a lo that line. So if you were staring at it with your telescope, you would just see one discrete color coming out of it from that. Okay. So this is supposed to be characterized this way. So don't worry about this stuff in the middle for a second. So here you have this gas that was heated. It's spitting out these photons of these very specific energies, and you might see a characteristic set of lines that describe what kind of atom it is. And the, and the, and the precise colors that you see, again, depend on the electron structure and therefore depend on the type of atom that it is. So the game that's played here, and this is one thing we use telescopes for, imagine you have a distant star, and you want to figure out what it's made of. All right. So how would you go about doing that? So imagine the star is emitting pure white light, and that's all that's going on. So it's emitting a pure black body. It's light shining. It's spreading out as it goes. And a little bit of it's hitting the Earth. And we can barely see it with our eye, so it's not very bright. So it's going to be hard to sort of spread that out and figure out what it's made of. So what you do is you build a telescope that has a big diameter that collects lots of light. You take that light and funnel it through effectively a prism or something called a spectrograph that spreads it out into its various wavelengths. And what you can see is this, the resulting spectrum that's continuous like that. 
And depending on where most of the light's coming out, you could use its black body temperature to figure out what temperature it is. So that's one thing you could learn right away just by looking at a star. Based on its color, you could figure out what its temperature was. If the gas is heated, okay, let's say you just have a ball of glowing gas out there. It would be emitting light at a very specific wavelength. It's like it's funneled through a telescope, then through a spectrograph. It spreads it out over its all various colors, but the only colors that appear are these. So we can use these colors to figure out what the heated gas is made of, what kind of atoms it's made of. Similarly, there's an intermediate step. So let's say you have this light source, but then there's something else in the way, like just a blob of interstellar gas out there that you couldn't otherwise see. You can detect it because you send it through a prism, spread it out, you see the background spectrum, but then there's all these places where it absorbs the light. That's called absorption lines. And when you do that, you're figuring out what this gas cloud is made of by using this signature. It's like fingerprints of the atom that you're collecting there. Okay, does that make sense? Are there any questions about what I'm talking about here? Yeah. Yes. That's if the heated, so this is actually assuming the heated gas is made of the same stuff as okay. the cloud. And then that's why, see that bit is light blue and that's what appears here. And that bit's dark blue in there and then it's orange and orange. Okay. Yeah. So the second line is showing the mission Yes, this is called emission lines. I probably should have said that. The mission, and this is Absorption. So, I mean, more generally, I realize this is kind of dry, okay? But it's important to understand this, I think, because this is how we know what stuff is made of. This is how we know what stuff is made of in space, but in a lot of cases, it's how we figure out what stuff is made of, like, on Earth, like everything. This is really fundamental to how we understand stuff, this idea of emission lines and absorption lines. And moreover, it's fundamentally sort of mysterious that all atoms tend to, they just like certain types of light and don't like other types of light. Like that's a fundamental sort of makeup of atoms. And it has to do with this bizarre property that um, light, for example, has this dual property of wavelength and also particle-like properties that it has discrete energies based on its wavelength. It's sort of a mysterious thing that you only see in quantum mechanics. So the other thing, so this general type of science is called spectroscopy. Um, and so spectroscopy is used to tell us about the makeup of celestial objects, for example. The other thing it can do, which I'll talk about later in the course, I won't talk very much about it now, is it also allows us to measure how fast stuff is moving. It turns out that when you have light, this is called the Doppler effect, we talked about this before, if you have a thing that's emitting radiation and it's coming towards you, its light gets blue shifted. That is, the wavelengths of all the light get shifted um, to the left. And if it's moving away from you, the wavelengths of all the light get shifted to the red. Okay, and that's this way. So let's say you have a star that was just sitting there. It wasn't moving at all relative to us. It would have some discrete spectral lines associated with what the star is made of. Okay, so you would see this. But then if that same star was moving away from us, all of those lines would shift in the redward direction. Okay. Now, astronomers or computer programs or, you know, sophisticated techniques know that when you have three lines that are spaced by exactly this much, that corresponds to, let's say, hydrogen. People recognize that. But then if you see, oh, but they're not sitting at the right colors of where they should be. They're all moved in one direction. We know that the reason why that's happening is because the star is moving away from us. And the amount by which they're shifted to the red <coughs> is proportional to how fast it's moving away from us. So by that, looking at this, we can say, oh, I know what that star is made of. I also know it's moving away from us at some speed. Similarly, the same thing's going on here, except now the star's coming towards us. 
So this is one way we can figure out how stars are, what stars are made of, and also how fast they're moving relative to us. So this is how you, you begin to understand, you begin to take measure of the universe by saying, I know what that thing's made of, I know whether it's coming towards me or going away from me, and you begin to sort of develop a coherent picture about what's going on, even with systems that are so far away that we'll never be able to send a telescope to. Or, I mean, a, an astronaut to, I guess is what I meant. Okay. Questions about this? Okay. Now, coming again back to this idea of light has different types of wavelengths, I wanted to remind you again, because I asked you twice the same homework problem twice by accident, but clearly this is important to me, it's in my head, um, why it is that astronomers put telescopes up into space and why there are specific types of telescopes we put into space and others we tend not to put into space. Okay? So one of the main reasons for that is not all types of electromagnetic radiation gets all the way to the ground. Okay? Gamma rays tend not to make it to the ground. And that's good. That's one good thing about our atmosphere. It shields us from extragalactic local uh, gamma ray radiation. It also shields us from x-rays, which is good. But visible light makes it all the way to the ground. And that's nice. And of course, some infrared light and some ultraviolet light makes it to the ground. Your ultraviolet light that makes it to the ground is the stuff that gives you a suntan or a sunburn, depending on who you are or how long you're out. Uh, and the infrared light that makes it to the ground is partially what heats us, uh, heats the Earth. But mostly what happens is the visible light gets to the ground that heats the Earth, and then the Earth radiates in infrared. Radio waves also make it to the ground. And that's why you tend to see radio telescopes, you know, just pointing up. Okay? And that's why also we can send radio transmissions up to satellites in space, and then they can send them back down to us. Okay? So this is how you can keep, we transmit signals in the radio because they travel up and down through the atmosphere very well. So we can send a radio signal up to a satellite, and it can bounce it down to somebody else in another part of Earth. You wouldn't do that with gamma rays. It wouldn't work. Um, this is just another way of illustrating it. This is the how many kilometers you know, up or down the light gets to us. And you can see that they're, you know, x-rays don't make it to the ground, gamma rays don't make it to the ground, visible lights make. And then there are some discrete types of visible light and infrared light that don't make it to the ground either. Um, and that's because there are specific types of molecules in the atmosphere that like to absorb this stuff. Okay. So one of the things that we did um, fairly recently, yeah. The question was, would we be more likely to put a gamma ray telescope into space or a radio wave telescope? Yes. So, are you trying to say that the answer to the question would be radio waves? Um, no. The answer is the other way around. So, if we wanted to study things that were emitting radio waves, we wouldn't need to put a radio telescope into space because the radio waves come all the way down to us and we can just look up and collect them. If we wanted to some study something far away, that was emitting gamma rays, we couldn't just wait on the ground and look for it because those gamma rays will never get to us, so we have to launch a telescope, put it up here, and look. And so we can do that either by launching balloons. It turns out you don't actually have to need a satellite to do that because you don't have to get up that high. You know, well, you know, 50 kilometers. So there are, there are some experiments that either launch, either, there are some experiments that actually fly airplanes up high and then you sort of you know, open the door of the airplane and look up and try to study stuff. Or you can actually launch it in a satellite. Um, so that's the idea. There's actually another reason why we don't put radio telescopes into space that's much more practical. Yeah. Have you? Yeah, like, so that's a radio telescope. You probably don't want to put that in space. You know, I mean, it's probably impossible to put that in, sp in space, right? Um, so, but, you know, um, and, and why are radio telescopes so big? Anyone know? Yeah. Yeah, because their wa radio wavelength is so big, you need a really big telescope to collect it and do something with it. Um, so, I mean, an example of us putting telescopes into space is an X-ray observatory called Chandra X-ray Observatory, um, and uh, made at 
this is named after a famous Indian American um, astronomer named Chandra Sekhar, whose nickname was Chandra. Uh, and uh, I always think it's funny they named the satellite after his nickname. Uh, but anyway, a very famous guy won a Nobel Prize, predicted the existence of all kinds of interesting things like pulsars, work on black holes, and that kind of stuff. And in fact, you know, it's one of the things we use X rays for is to study emission from regions right around black holes. So, um, so this is a this is actually an X ray image of gas orbiting around a black hole that was taken by uh, this Chandra X ray satellite. Um, this is a huge black hole. It's seven times more massive than the sun. And um, what's happening is the gas, it's got so much gravity, the gas is going around it so fast and it gets so dense that it emits light in the X-ray. So it's very, very hot, so it's emitting light in the X-ray. So, okay. So I'm just clarifying this. X-rays, you go from space, visible, you tend to do that from ground or from space. <coughs> Infrared, you study that with satellites typically and radio usually from the ground, almost always from the ground. Now, so that's kind of the era of modern astronomy. If you recall, I talked about this idea of spectroscopy uh, before, and I, and I mentioned to you that um, you know, spectroscopy is how we know, for example, what the sun is made of. But we now know that the sun is made almost entirely of hydrogen. A little bit of helium, but almost entirely of hydrogen. And I talked about how Cecilia Payne was the first person to actually figure this out, because she was one of the first people to realize at least one of the first astronomers to realize what spectroscopy was, what you could do with these spectral lines to figure out what stuff is made of. Up until this time, people thought that the sun was going to be made of basically what the Earth is made of. But the Earth certainly is not majority hydrogen. Um, so the sun is distinctly different than the sun, I mean, than the Earth. So for example, for every one million atoms of hydrogen uh, in the sun, there are only 98,000 atoms of helium and only 850 atoms of oxygen. And as you get heavier, there is a smaller and smaller percentage of other types of atoms in the sun. So the sun has a lot, a lot of hydrogen and almost nothing else. Okay. Now, as I will begin to talk about, all, well, in the early universe, we now basically believe that all, the only atoms that existed were hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium, and that's it. And uh, all other atoms that are heavier than that were made inside of stars. They were fused together in the centers of stars. So think about what that means for a second. So that means every atom in this room that's not hydrogen or helium, so all the carbon in your bodies, the fundamental thing that makes life possible, all the oxygen we're breathing, all of that stuff was created in stars, in other stars, not the sun, but other stars, who since have died and either blown apart or whimpered out, shed the new atoms that they made into the galaxy, and then the next generation of stars were born. And around one of those generations of stars, you know, the Earth formed. So we are all, are all star stuff in that sense, right? So all of us are fundamentally created by atoms that were forged inside of stars, possibly like the sun. We're a little bit different, but not that much different than the sun. So the sun is 110 times the diameter of the Earth. It's very, very big. And on occasion, these giant solar flares erupt from the surface. And these solar flares are like, look how big they are. They're huge solar flares that emit all kinds of blurbs of energy every now and again. We can image the sun in lots of different wavelengths now. So this is a picture of the sun in the ultraviolet. And what you see is the surface of the sun is made black here because we're imaging in the ultraviolet. And most of the light coming out of the sun is not in the ultraviolet, but in the visible. And what we see is this stuff, this stuff we see is these loops, is really, really hot gas that's emitting in the ultraviolet. Uh, this gas is like millions of degrees. Um, and the reason why they form these loops is because there are just massive magnetic fields coming off the surface of the sun that trap 
particles that loop them around. So these magnetic fields make the particles travel around in these loops. The surface of the sun, the, the thing that makes it basically yellow, is called the photosphere. Um, and uh, like I told you before, the surface temperature of the sun is about 6,000 degrees. Um, the sun occasionally has these spots that are dark. Those are called sunspots. Um, we understand a little bit about where sunspots come from, but they're, the number of sunspots the sun has at any given time is somewhat random. Um, the amount of energy coming out of the sun is mostly constant, but it does fluctuate a little bit. And the amount of energy coming out of the sun, we think, correlates a little bit with uh, sunspots. Um, a lot of people are interested in the parts of the sun. You'll see a lot of these diagrams. I'm not going to test you over this detailed stuff. But basically, there's a core part of the sun that's very, very, very hot, so 15 million degrees. Um, and there's a convection, there's, there's convection going on in the sun. So hot stuff is light and rises, and then it gets cooler and sinks down. And it's sort of like that picture I showed you of the candle that changes depending on whether there's gravity. The strong gravity in the sun creates interesting currents in it that move stuff around. Um, I think that's really all I want to say. I'll show you a cool picture of the sun. Um, you can also, there's a lot of people who spend their lives studying the sun. And it's not such a crazy thing to do because, as I'll mention, uh, you know, the sun is responsible for all life on Earth. If there was no sun, there'd be nothing. Uh, so, you know, you're going to spend your time studying something. It's not a crazy thing to study. Um, we can, this is just different images of the sun using different types of light. So this is ultraviolet light. It tends to pick up 60,000 degree gas. So you see there's hot spots on the sun. This is million degree gas imaged in the x-ray. Um, this is two and a half million gas, also in Imaged in sort of shorter wavelength X-ray, uh, so there's, you know, the sun has interesting structure. There's a lot of stuff kind of pouring out of it. There's hot stuff coming out. The photosphere is somewhat cooler. And so if this, it's this interesting ball of sort of hot, you know, ionized stuff. It's emitting emitting stuff coming out. One of the other things that's happening with the sun is there's something called the solar wind. Um, there's streams of charged particles that are flying off the sun. It's so hot, there's all kinds of charged particles just flying off the sun all the time. Um, so the corona is so hot that these charged particles just stream, stream out. Um, and, you know, you may know that, you know, these charged particles that are coming from the sun um, sometimes mess up communications on Earth. And uh, they also do things like cause pretty, pretty events sometimes, these, uh, these things called the northern lights. So has anyone ever seen the northern lights, aurora borealis? I wonder. If you've ever spent time like up in Alaska, um, you might have seen this. And it's just like a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. Uh, sort of waving bands of sort of fluorescent light. It looks like a light show in the sky. And what it is, it's charged particles coming from the sun to get filtered down along the first magnetic field, and you see them entering uh, the Earth at northern latitudes. Um, so people have seen these for a long time. Here are some images of what they look like. It's a pretty cool thing. And again, this is because of this stream of charged particles coming from the sun interacting with the magnetic field of the Earth. So partially, the magnetic field of the Earth protects us from this. Um, but it's also, it also makes these interesting things. Okay. So this is just kind of descriptive. I'm just showing you some pictures of the sun. But I wanted to step back a second and talk a bit about what the sun is doing and uh, how really it import, important it is for the Earth. So if you think a little bit about it, the sun is spitting out a tremendous amount of energy. Okay, so... So energy from the sun, you probably know this, supports more or less all the life on Earth. There might be some geothermal species or something, but the vast majority of life on Earth is supported by the sun via photosynthesis. Okay, so plants get their energy from the sun, then we eat plants, or cows eat plants and we eat cows, but ultimately we get the energy from the sun. Okay. Um, 
And moreover, besides the food that we eat, that the animals eat, all the energy that humans harness to do what we do, almost all of it at least, owes its ultimate origin to energy from the sun. Okay, so all the fossil fuels, right, they used to be fossils and plants, right? It's the carbon the fossils and plants that we eventually use to power stuff. Okay, so all that oil, all that stuff we use, all that energy, all that coal, obviously all the solar power, it's all ultimately derived from energy from the sun. So everything we have comes from the sun. Now, the only bit of energy we typically use that's not coming directly from the sun is nuclear energy. So nuclear energy, um, we're getting from, basically we're deriving that energy from past suns. So older suns that made really complicated elements that we now break apart and use that breaking apart of the element to fuel nuclear power. But everything else that we get power from on Earth comes from the sun. Okay. Now life through photosynthesis is only, take, is only using 0.1% of the energy from the sun that reaches the Earth's surface. So just a tiny, tiny bit of all the energy that's hitting the Earth is used by life to power everything. Okay, to keep everybody alive, all the animals alive, all the plants alive. It's 0.1% of the energy from the sun. And about a third of the energy that the sun's, that's reaching the Earth gets reflected back. We're not absorbing all of it. About a third of it's bouncing back from the water and from the clouds. And almost rest, all the rest of the energy goes to heat the land and the water, which then radiates away. Most of the energy that's been absorbed has then, has then radiated away. A little bit of it is trapped by the atmosphere. So if you think of it, just a tiny, tiny fraction of all the energy that's hitting the Earth from the sun are we using, and that's everything. That's all the power that does everything. Keeps everybody alive and powers everything we're doing. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff. And this is all because of the sun. The other thing that's amazing about this, remember how small the Earth is compared to the Sun. The Earth is 110 times smaller than the Sun, right? But moreover than that, the Earth is really, really far away from the Sun. So when the Sun is spitting out energy, right, just remember, it's not spitting all its energy right at the Earth. It's just going every direction, right? It's shining in all directions. So just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the energy that's coming out of the sun in all directions is absorbed, is even hitting the earth. It's not just, and it's, it's more than this 2D thing, remember, it's 3D. So there's all kinds of stuff coming out of the board, too. It's just going away. It's not being cut. So the earth only collects two billionths of all the energy coming out of the sun. So two one billionths of all the energy coming out of the sun is enough to power everything on Earth. All the power we have, all the oil that's underground, everything. Keep all the life alive, all that stuff. is two one billionths of the power coming out of the sun. Okay. So if we want, now let's try to quantify how much energy is coming out of the sun. So... The unit of energy that most people are very familiar with is the calorie. Okay? The calorie is how we gauge how much energy is in the food. Okay. So there are 10 to the 26 calories per second coming out of the sun. All right, It's almost an unimaginable number. A calorie technically is defined by the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. That's, what it, that's how you define a calorie. Calories, how much energy it takes to heat something. Now, the calories we hear about in food, it turns out, is not the technical calorie. The calories you hear about in food are, unfortunately, a thousand times a calorie. So if something has one calorie, it actually has a thousand times the capacity to heat one uh, gram of water, one degree Celsius. So if you put this all together, you know, a Big Mac has 500 food calories. So that's actually 500,000 physics calories. Okay. So you convert that, you'd say, okay, um, the food energy in a Big Mac, for example, could raise 500,000 grams of water at one degree Celsius. 
That's pretty good. That's a lot of energy. Um, so the sun's luminosity in these units is 2 times 10 to the 20 Big Macs. So there's 2 times 10 to the 20 <laughs> Big Macs of food energy, energy coming out of the sun. So that's also one fathomable. Okay, so when you put things like this, it's, just, it's sort of unfathomable how much energy is coming out of the sun. All right. So this is a huge amount of energy. All right. And people have known this for a long time. You know, as soon as people could begin to measure energy and think about stuff, you know, scientists in the 1900s, 1800s, 1900s knew this. And, you know, people started thinking, like, well, how is this possible? How can something possibly put out that much energy? I mean, if we knew how to build the sun, it would be very nice. Right? We'd have energy independence. If I had a sun in my, uh, you know, backyard, uh, it wouldn't be a problem. I wouldn't have to buy any energy. I could do whatever I wanted to do. I'd be all powerful, really, if I had a sun. Right? So, um, so how how does the sun do it? What is the sun doing? There's an interesting sort of story associated with this question of what powers the sun. And there's a famous debate. So there's all these debates in the history of science that are fun to talk about. And this one is between two people who are pretty famous. So this is a guy named Lord Kelvin. Um, who's the guy who uh, has the Kelvin temperature named after him. So arguably the most famous physicist living at the time. Um, one of the most revered physicists ever. Very powerful figure. And then there's this guy named Charles Darwin that some of you have heard of. Okay. Now, these guys had a debate about what was powering the sun. Now, why would Darwin be interested in the sun? So the reason why Darwin was interested in the sun is because he wanted to know how long has the sun been there. <coughs> because he wonders, well, how long have we had to do this evolution thing I'm thinking about? Because it's going to take a lot. I'm going to need the sun to have been there for a very long time. The earth, therefore, and therefore the earth is going to have to have been there for a very long time <coughs> to make this whole evolution thing work. So that's why Darwin was interested in, in what powers the sun and the age of the sun. Lord Kelvin had read Darwin's book because, you know, it was kind of popular. It got a lot of buzz. And he said, well, this is foolish. There's no way the sun could be this old. So this is what Kelvin did. Kelvin said, well, the most powerful energy source that I know of is gravity. Okay? So the thing that's powering the sun must be its own gravity. So what's happening is the sun is this big ball of mass, and the mass is slowly constricting on itself. That's generating heat, and that's emitting all kinds of energy. Okay. In fact, he can figure out how much energy the sun has based on pretty simple physics of gravity. Okay. So the gravitational energy of the sun, it turns out, you can derive it from Newton's laws. It's Newton's constant. It's the same g that occurs in Newton's law, Newton's formulas times the mass of the sun squared divided by the radius of the sun. All this stuff was known. And he estimated it to have a total energy of 10 to the 41 calories. Okay, that's a lot. And then what he did is he wanted to figure out how old the sun could be. If it's spinning out that much energy, what's a good estimate of how old it is? And what he did is he did, he, he sort of he did something like the following. He knows how much energy is coming out of the sun per second. So that's something we can measure, how much energy is coming out of the sun per second. And he knows how much energy it has. So he, sh he can estimate how many seconds it could be there. This is a lot like, let's say you walk into this room. I don't know why you do this. There's a big bucket hanging here. Big bucket full of water. And there's a hole in the bucket. And it's just pouring out, just pouring out onto the floor. All right? And you're like, well, how long has this been going on? How long has the bucket been leaking water all over the floor? I want to know whether it was the last professor's fault or what. So one way to estimate that is you measure how much water is coming out per second. Okay. Let's say you know it's a half a liter every minute. And then you measure how big the bucket is. And it's 10 liters. Okay. 
So if it's still got, you know, if it's got 10 liters of water in it, and water's coming out, let's say, a liter a minute, something like 10 minutes is going to drain the bucket. Right? 10 minutes is going to be gone. So a good estimate for the age of the bucket is about 10 minutes, because maybe it's half full. Okay, so it's something like that. So that's kind of what Lord Kelvin did. He said, this is how much energy is funneling out of the sun. This is how much energy it has. And I can use that to figure out roughly how long it's been around. And when he does that, the luminosity of the sun is 10 to the 26 calories per second. The total energy of the sun is 10 to the 41 calories. If you do this ratio, you find this is 41 minus 26 is 15. So it's 10 to the 15 seconds. That's 30 million years. So Kelvin says, oh, the sun is about 30 million years old. What did Darwin say? Darwin did not estimate the age of the sun using physics. He was not a physicist. Instead, he used it by studying erosion patterns. And what he said is, look, I can measure how fast this cliff is eroding. This, there's a feature in England called the belt. I can measure how long it takes for erosion to happen year by year. You can measure the depth of this trench, you know, like the Grand Canyon. You know, it takes so long for the Grand Canyon to get deep. You know how much is getting taken away every year, and you know how deep it is. You have some estimate of how long it's been, this has been happening. And he estimated that the age of the Earth has to be greater than 300 million years in order to get this deep trench, and that and therefore, by extension, the sun must be at least 300 million years old. So this is quite different than what Kel that Kelvin got. Okay. So Kelvin read this, and he was like, well, Darwin is an idiot. Okay, there is no way that the sun is 300 million years old. I just did the calculation, and I'm Lord Kelvin. So Darwin must be wrong. And, you know, he sort of attacked him. You know, he attacked him directly. And in print, like, what are we to make of this? This crazy assertion. There's no way the Earth can be this old. Like, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And in fact, Darwin was very disturbed by this. Because, you know, this is Lord Kelvin. He didn't know any physics. And he was like, hmm. So he took it out. If you look at the first edition of Origin of Species, this is a discussion of the age of the Earth. If you look at the second edition of Origin of Species, the discussion of the age of the Earth. So, uh, you know, but the, pro the, the interesting thing is that Darwin was, was right. And Kelvin was wrong. So we now know that the, we now have a pretty good estimate that the sun and the earth are like 4.6 billion years old, much older than 300 million years. But why? So why was Lord Kelvin wrong? Does anyone know? Well, gravity does not power the sun. So Kelvin assumed that gravity was powering the sun, but that's not what makes the sun shine. The thing that makes the sun shine is E equals mc squared. So this is Einstein. So Einstein, in 1905, wrote down this equation that you've probably seen. OK? And this was the first step to understanding actually what it is that powers the sun. What this formula means, it says that everything that has mass, in principle, has the potential to create lots of energy. Okay. And in some sense, energy and mass are sort of equivalent things. So remember, this number, this, this C is the speed of light, this M is the mass, and this is the energy. So if I have something that has a small mass, I multiply it by the speed of light squared. And remember, the speed of light is the biggest speed there is. It's a very, very big speed. And if I square it so I get a huge number, I can multiply it by a little mass and get a lot of energy. And so because of this formula, eventually it was realized that you can create a lot, a lot of energy in the sun without using gravity. And in fact, what happens in the sun, we know now, is that hydrogen is being squeezed together and eventually making helium out of hydrogen. So hydrogen atoms are fused together 
to make a new atom, a new helium atom. So effectively, you take four hydrogens, you squeeze them together, you make helium. And in the process of doing that, you lose mass. Helium is lighter than the four hydrogens. If you measure the mass of helium, and you measure the mass of four hydrogens, you find that helium is lighter. So when this fusion happens, you lose mass. And this missing mass is converted into energy, and that's the energy that powers the sun. So it's like a nuclear furnace going on in the center of the sun, and that's what's generating energy. And you generate lots and lots and lots of energy this way. It's a much more efficient energy generator than gravitational energy or any other kind of energy that we're aware of. And that's what's powering the sun. So, like I said, this process is called nuclear fusion. You're fusing, you're fusing four protons together and making helium out of it. Interestingly, to do this, effectively what happens is two of the protons, so remember, so hi hydrogen, remember, is just a proton. The basic hydrogen is just a proton. Okay. Helium is two protons and two neutrons. So effectively what happens is protons turn into neutrons and you create a new nucleus, and energy is created from this. So to give you an example, uh, so... So, you know, the specifics are that the mass of a helium nucleus is 0.7% less than the sum of four hydrogen nuclei. So the amount of mass difference is just 0.7%. But every time this happens, you gain just a little bit of energy. And remember, there's a lot, a lot of hydrogen atoms in the sun because it's so big and massive that you're generating a lot of energy this way. And then again, it all comes about because of this equation e equals mc squared. Are there questions about this? Yeah? So you said there's more, much more hydrogen than helium in the sun. Yeah. How can it be sustainable that? Um, it just hasn't run out yet. So eventually the sun will run out of hydrogen. And um, when it does, things will change. <laughs> so... Um, you know, several billion years from now, the sun is going to run out of hydrogen. And uh, then there'll only be helium left. And then there'll be a big change. Um, it'll become, well, it will, the outer part will, basically the furnace will shut off a little bit. At the central, well, I'll talk more about this, but basically what happened is, there's all this gravity that wants to come in, but there's a nuclear furnace in there that's keeping it pushed out. So it's like heat pushing out and gravity pushing in. Eventually, that central furnace is going to turn off when the hydrogen runs out. It'll get denser more, and then the helium will start to fuse to make heavier elements. So helium will get diffused, and eventually, that's how heavier elements begin to get built up, that you have fusion of heavier and heavier elements. When that happens, it's kind of, it goes faster and faster and faster. So as soon as the hydrogen runs out, the sun is going to be on its way to dying, basically. Um, when that happens, this outer part of the sun will get really big. It'll, it'll certainly encompass Mercury, Venus, and it'll almost touch Earth. And so things will change dramatically on Earth when that happens. Um, but yeah, so, and, that, and by understanding details of what's going on, like what the sun is made of, how bright it is now, blah, 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 that's how we estimate how old it is. And that's how we know how long it's going to live, roughly, you know, not exactly. So let me back up a little bit. I'm talking a lot about energy. I'm throwing the word energy around. Like, what is energy? Okay. So uh, let me flip back. I don't want to. So what is energy? Okay. When we talk about energy, what are we talking about? Right. Energy is the quantity that allows us to do stuff. Okay. <laughs> That's really what it is, and we have an intuitive feel for that. Like we all know, you need energy to like make your car go and to make yourself run upstairs and do whatever. But of course, you also need energy to maintain your body temperature, right? When it's really cold outside, you burn more calories than when it, the temperature is the same as your body temperature, right? So you're using energy all the time to do stuff. In physics, this is quantified as the capacity to do work, okay? And when you do work on something, what that means is you're applying a force through a distance. So if I have a heavy thing and I push it 
through a distance, I'm doing work. Okay, that's what energy is. And energy is what allows you to do work. It allows you to take heavy things and move them around, etc. Okay. Um, energy itself is actually a fairly new word. It's a 19th century word. Okay. And now we sort of have this understanding that there's lots of different things that have energy. Okay. Coal has energy locked in it. And we can get energy out of the coal if we burn it. Okay. But also, you know, there's energy in flowing water. And we can get energy out of the flowing water. You know, if we put a paddle in it, we can make it do so. Okay. And people realized in the 19th century that energy, in fact, was conserved. That if I have something that has some energy in it, that energy is never lost. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So if you have a train, for example, and you have coal in the engine of the train, you burn the coal. You burn the coal, that powers the wheels, and the train starts moving. So you've taken the energy out of the coal, and you've turned it into energy of motion of the train. So the train is moving along, and by, move, you know, by the train moving along, it has some energy. Okay, and I can do something with that, right? I can run the train into a building. I can create stuff, you know, I can knock walls down with it. You know, you can do stuff when you have energy of motion. Okay. Now, there's not all the energy goes into the motion of the train. Some of it is lost. So, for example, some of it is created smoke. And the energy is propelling smoke up through the smokestack. But if you were to count up all the energy, the energy that's lost and the energy that goes into the motion, it's all conserved. So energy, we believe, is conserved. And when you have a machine that's very, very efficient, what you're doing is you're taking the energy out of the power source and converting it into what you want to do in a very efficient way without losing the energy to sources that are hard to deal with, like heat, okay, or friction, or other stuff that's not, that you can't use. But energy, we think, is conserved, or at least proposed in the 19th century was realized that it probably is conserved. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is that all types of energy can be measured in the same way. Another thing we... You know, another unit of energy as opposed to the calorie is called a joule. Um, and joules is a more typical measurement of energy. Um, a joule is about 4,000 calories. I um, and, um, you know, we measure the energy that comes into our homes in joules, okay? What's really measured is kilowatt hours, but kilowatt hours as units of joules, basically. I mean, modulo a factor of, you know, how many hours there are in a second. But we measure our energy in joules. All the type of energy in our home we can measure in the same unit. So a kilowatt hour, you can measure a kilowatt hour of electricity, but you can also measure a kilowatt hour of other types of energy. It's all the same thing. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is, it was known in the 19th century then that energy was conserved. And it was also believed... And that's called the law of conservation of energy. It was also believed that there was another law called conservation of mass. Conservation of mass basically means you can't create or destroy anything. All right? If I have a log and I burn it, you might at first think, well, the log is going to disappear. So I've lost mass. The log has lost its mass. But if I were to add up all the mass that came off of the log as it burned, all the smoke and soot, all the atoms that were released in the smoke and soot, and also you know, keep track of all the ash that's left, left over after it burns, and I add all that up, it will weigh exactly the same. It will have the same mass as the log before it burned. So this idea of conservation of mass is basically that you can't create or destroy matter. That's what that means, yeah. Is he sort of also denying the idea of optimists? Because they said they existed in the past. Oh, at this time? Um, well, okay. So, there weren't a lot of alchemists in the year 1900. There were a lot of alchemists in the year 1600. And they kind of fell back, and then they sort of fell out. 
you know, there probably were some crazy people in the 1900s who were believed were alchemists. But alchemists are people who believe you can turn lead into gold. Okay. So, but what this says is, you know, I, you could say this in a really strict sense. If you wanted to be, if you wanted to use the law of conservation of mass, you could say, okay, maybe it's possible to turn lead into gold, but the mass can't change. But really, you can see. If you think about this a little bit, in order to turn lead into gold, you know, if you find lead, I don't know where they are, lead, over oh, this, lead and gold, look how good I am. Gold and lead. See, gold has 79 protons and lead has 82. So to turn lead into gold, you would have to take the nucleus of the atom and add protons to it. That doesn't seem like a very easy thing to do, certainly in the year 1600 or whatever, and even in the year 1900, right? And in principle, you could do that. The problem is it costs way more money to do that than it does just to buy gold. So, you know, you would never do that. So I think the, the understanding was beginning to develop at this time that, like, that probably wasn't going to work. But more generally, this idea was you can't create or destroy matter. Yeah, it does kind of get to that because the idea is sort of you can't – well, I'll, I'll mention that. I'll come back to that in a second. So this idea of conservation of energy was also thought to exist, that you can't, if once you have energy, it only moves around to different forms of energy, it doesn't, you know, you can't create or destroy energy either. Einstein's idea that mass and energy are equivalent basically was combining these two together. That it's not that mass is conserved separately and energy is conserved separately. It's that mass energy is conserved. So you can create matter out of nothing. But it takes energy to do that. And you can lose matter. You can lose mass. But when you do that, you create energy when you do it. So that's the idea. You can turn one type of atom into another type of atom in principle. But it takes a lot of energy to do that. And that's what's going on in the sun. The sun is actually gaining energy by doing this. The sun is taking two protons or four protons and making a helium nucleus out of that, and from that, delivering energy. Um, and I think, I think I'm probably going to end here, and I'll talk more about this stuff later because I've talked a lot today. But I just wanted to mention, you hear about nuclear reactors on Earth, okay? Nuclear reactors on Earth are doing a similar thing, except they're taking big, complicated nuclei and breaking them apart. And by breaking apart big, complicated nuclei, you gain energy. And that's what's going on in nuclear reactors on Earth. That's called fission. So fusion is what's going on in the sun, and fission is what's going on in nuclear reactors. Okay. You too. Hi. So you said um, uh, the sun is about like six thousand degrees Kelvin, and it emits surface of six thousand. Yeah. yeah. So. And you said like that's like around the yellow. Is that around the yellow? It's around the yellow. Yeah. So say when the sun rises and when the sun sets, it's a little bit more orange. Does that yeah. Mean it's cooler? It's no. Like so what's going on there is the sun's light is shining through the atmosphere right. of the Earth, and when the sun, like when you see when you see sunrise, mm -hmm. it's going through a lot of atmosphere, right? And that's absorbing a lot of light. Okay. And so, so what happens is it turns out that the blue light is absorbed more readily than the red light. Right. And so what happens is, um, like, so here's the surface of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And really the Earth is spinning, but let's just say this, the sun is here, and then as it, as it moves, it's like this, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is, there's a lot of atmosphere. There's a lot, the Earth travels, the sun goes through a lot of atmosphere when, it, when, it, when it's near the horizon. And what's the reason for that? Is it just there's more atmosphere? Um, it's just a projection effect. There's right. just more along the line. There's just um, there's just more stuff in the way. 
okay. when it's when it's like that and when it's right overhead, basically, there's okay. more stuff. And when the sun and and blue light gets absor- and blue light gets absorbed, mm-hmm. so all the light. Let's say that like this is blue and this is red. It tends to absorb the blue light, and the blue light scatters and goes on and bounces. It basically bounces around. The red goes straight through, and you tend to see red. Right. But when the sun is directly overhead. That doesn't happen as much, and we mostly see white. The other thing that happens is the blue light scatters and bounces around, bounces everywhere, and eventually comes back down to you. And that's why the sky is blue. So the sky is blue because that's all mostly all scattered light, not direct light from the sun, but light has bounced around. And the blue light bounces around more readily than the red light. So does that have anything to do with the moon looking slightly like red? Sometimes when the moon is red, that's what you're seeing. So when the moon looks red on certain certain nights when it rises. That's what it is. It's just there's a lot of dust. Okay. And when it, you'll notice that, like, if you're at places where it's, it's been dusty or there's been, like, a storm recently, you'll have really beautiful sunsets, and that's because there's just more dust and stuff in the air. Right. So what you see, the more dust there is, that dust likes to absorb and scatter blue light, and it like, lets more of the red light through and you have these vibrant red suns. Okay. I see. Yeah. So it's due to a different phenomenon. It's not, a, yeah, it's not temperature. You, yeah, because you said um, the temperature is about the same, but, like, little fluctuations. I was just yeah, no, that's not what it is. So that would correspond to like a really big fluctuation. Right, so right, if right. the sun changed temperature enough to actually change color, that's that right. would be bad. <laughs> yeah. all so, right. All right, see you later. Well, um, I'm Jason, by the way. Oh, hi, Jason. It's I nice think I you. asked a lot of questions. No, I'm glad, I'm glad to know. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Um, I have a question about the mission line. 